never mind the patch of gray that's under my chin. I uh, felt a, a need to blend in with the persons we're presenting to today. So very quickly. So some of you remember some of these things, newspapers, black and white television, rotary phones, you know, black and white um, shoot 'em up videos, um, even cameras, and of course, letters. That has changed. So we've introduced information technology throughout all spheres of life. And what is ICT? ICT simply stands for Information and Communications Technology. This includes data, internet access, cloud computing, software, hardware, transactions, and communications technology. But more importantly, it's a combination and application of these components. Now, one of the things that's been difficult for me in, in putting together this presentation is to stay away from a lot of those technical <laughs> jargons. So allow me to explain a few things. So when I talk about data, we're talking about the information that's stored and used in technology. Those could be things like name, address, bank information, those sort of things. Hardware is typically the physical components of things that you touch, your monitor, your keyboard, your tablet, your phone. And software is the programs that actually run these um, computer. Internet access is simply the process of connecting to the internet using your favorite device. And transactions broadly are either the online or automated transactions between two or more persons or businesses or people to businesses as well. And communications technology is the process of communicating that data across various channels. And finally, which is the new thing that's happening now is cloud computing. And basically that's the delivery of computing services over the internet. So often ICT is used interchangeably with in information technology, which is what I'm in, um, but it's more comprehensive than that um, because it involves more components than just the um, computers and the digital technology. So if you had to compare the two, you would think of IT as a nice single sandwich and more beef is what we would call information and communication technology. So what's the impact of ICT? Certainly it's changed the way that we've worked, communicate, learn, and interact. It continues to revolutionize all parts of the human experience and it contributes significantly to economic development, not only in countries such as the Bahamas, but around the world. And it's often called the fourth industrial re revolution. And it opens many global possibilities, not only for businesses, but for connections and relationships. So ICT for seniors. So as Mavis er um, said earlier, it was very easy for younger persons to pivot um, during Corona with the use of technology. And that's because they've grown up <clears throat> using it. And often we as older adults, and I'm including myself, find it difficult to understand how modern technology works and how we could use it for our benefit. So over the last few years, there's been numerous um, improvements to technology, not only for access for older adults, but in terms of providing specific benefits. And I'll go through a few of those um, if you followed me. So we're finding more and more that seniors are um, equipping themselves and enabling themselves through classroom and online learning, but feel free to ask your younger kids, your grandkids to help you with this as well. They will share and impart a wealth of knowledge on how to use and safely use these types of equipment and devices. So the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention is the internet. And so when we think of the internet, um, broadly it's the mechanism from, for which we communicate but I'll talk about it from, in a more simpler way for you. You'll be familiar with terms like Google or your online banking um, site, maybe the Tribune site, or even more importantly, the government of the Bahamas portal. These are all accessible over the internet. Things you could do on the internet as a senior, online shopping. So previously, if you wanted to go and get something, you had to actually physically go there, whether that's a local food store or you want to go away. Now you can do that all online. Online banking, rather than staying in long lines, you can actually 
check your account, transfer balances, and a plethora of all other things. Someone will speak about that in a few minutes. Video chat and video calls. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but with the technology that's available now, you can actually have a video chat with not only someone here locally, but anywhere around the world. You can share photographs and memories. You can watch TV shows and movies over technology such as Netflix, Amazon, and others. The next ICT technology to talk about is mobile phones, because I think this is a little more um, available for a lot of persons. With your mobile phone, you, again, you have voice and video chat. You have medication reminders that you can install in apps. You can have emergency alerts. A lot of the newer phones now allow you to press a combination of buttons and automatically call one or more contacts if there's an emergency. You can share photos and memories, as I said, and watch movies and TVs as well. We also have tablets, right? Which are larger screen devices, almost similar to phones. They are very affordable and they, they bridge the divide between a mobile phone and a PC. They're very mobile. They install, much of the same apps on the uh, phone are also installed on your tablet. And they're great for gaming. Why did I put that there? You know, as we progress in life, there are things that we need to do to make sure we maintain full functionality as well. And they've, it's proven that uh, some games do help with your mental um, faculties and improving your memory and those sort of things. So consider it as well, whether it's Scrabble or filling a crossword puzzle, all of those things keep your mind active and keep you healthy. You can even look up recipes on your tablet, cook with your wife, significant other, or your family, right? Fitness devices. If you don't have a fitness device, you're missing out on something that's awesome as a senior. It can check your heart rate. It can take note of your step count. They say you should be taking at least 10,000 steps a day. I'm trying to do that myself. It can check your calories that you've burnt during the, the day. It can check your sleep patterns and report to you. And it will help you as a senior stay fit, stay mentally poised at the end of the day. So if you can, get a health um, monitor tracker, like a smartwatch or a Fitbit or one of those devices. <laughs> Earlier, I talked about apps. And these are things that um, are installed on your tablets, even your um, PCs, as well as on your mobile devices. These apps allow you to access news and important world events, the weather, social media information. You can shop with these apps and you can listen to music as well. But I can't finish my presentation without warning you about the bad side or the things that you should be concerned about regarding the internet. And that is cybersecurity. There's a big thing called phishing and no, not this phishing here. We're talking about Sorry. Sorry. We're talking about those persons who attempt to bait you into providing your credit card information, your username and password, even confidential data about yourself so that they can use that for uh, wrongdoing, right? So how do you protect yourself against phishing and other scams and other cybersecurity threats? Well, certainly what you should be doing is using passwords and passphrases. I single out passphrase here because it's very important that your password or passphrase be very complex and difficult for someone to easily get. An example of a passphrase would be, I love Lucy, 1003 and an exclamation mark because it's very difficult for someone to know that passphrase. And always use a passphrase that's personal to you as well. Think before you click. It's very easy to be beguiled by a very pretty email that says, hey, you've won $1,000. Click on this link to redeem, redeem the prize. Think before you click. Keep your software updated. Anytime um, there is an update, I would encourage you to update the software on your mobile phone, on your laptop, or on your tablet. Share with care. 
In our society, we're very open in some cases. You would want to be very discreet about the information that you share, whether that's personal photos, personal information, uh, all of those things, because those not only can they be used for um, in other ways, but sometimes hackers would use that to try and figure out your password as well. And check to see if it's a secure site. Most secure sites would have HTTP, all secure sites, sorry, would have HTTPS. And I'll explain that. So <clears throat> don't email personal and uh, financial information if requested by a message to you. Your bank will never send you a request to confirm your username and password. Always look for indicators that the site is secure, as I said before. Typically, there's a lock icon on the browser page or the URL, and it always begins with an HTTPS, and the S stands for secure. Always, and this is just a quick tip, or regularly review your credit card and bank account statements as soon as you receive them to make sure there aren't any unauthorized charges. That way you can promptly deal with your banking institution in regards to the matter. Other ones, I, I talked about a complex password or passphrase. <clears throat> Second one is try not to use the same password or passphrase with all of your internet accounts on your phone, on your laptop. Why? Because if someone finds out that one password, they have access to everything. Now, you're probably going to say, well, I can't remember all of these passwords. There are a number of passwords managers that are out there. And I could speak about that in the question and answer. Always add protective software like a firewall or antivirus to your laptop, your tablet, or your phone. And these protect you. Think of it as adding locks to your house and an alarm system. And last but not least, if it's too good to be true, more than likely it is. Don't be overly trusting. Always look for the signs. Read carefully. If necessary, call the company or the person to confirm that the, in, the email or message is legitimate before you can. So ICT for, for seniors. It's easier and simpler than ever. The applications are very easy to navigate. Most of the icons are very big and easy to click on. It can help you keep track of things. I didn't talk about, I briefly mentioned medication reminder. There are apps that remind you when you should take a medication. There are apps that should tell you when you can go to bed, right? It helps to keep you informed and connected. And I'm sure we're all aware of this, whether it's a WhatsApp message group, whether it's an alert from an installed news application, it helps you to stay informed and connected. It's easy to bank and perform transactions online. No longer do you have to go into the bank, withdraw, and then deposit um, funds somewhere else. You can actually transfer those funds between banks online easily. And someone will speak more about that as well. And with that, thank you. Internet banking, digital banking, as known as e-banking. So all these words basically mean the same thing. So you have people using other words, don't let that confuse you. When they're talking about e-banking or digital <laughs> banking, internet banking, or online banking, it's basically the same thing. And what it is, is a distribution channel. And I think um, Mr. Bodhi kind of said that to you, you know, we've had to learn a lot of new things since COVID-19. And we've had to do so many things differently go to school, work remotely, go to church, online. And so the, the internet is actually a new distribution channel. It's a channel that helps you get what you're trying to get to. It's not a product. It's not anything that you have to, um, it's not something you buy or sell or eat. It's actually just a method to use to get where you want to go. And so COVID has taught us that we couldn't go to church physically, so how do we get to church? We go on the internet. We, that distribution channel is a way to meet our friends in church via Zoom. How do we get to school now? We go to school through that distribution channel called the internet. How do we go to work some days? We go to work through that distribution channel called the internet. And so how do we bank? We're gonna be banking through that distribution channel called the internet. So it allows you to not have to physically go to the bank, but to do all that you need through this distribution channel. It allows you to do every financial transaction, well, most financial transactions, from the benefit of 
your front room, your living room, your bed. And so internet banking is actually not a product, like some persons think, it's actually a distribution channel. So how do we start? So of course, you need a bank account. So we are not at the place in the Bahamas where you can actually open that bank account by the internet. You actually have to go into the bank to open an account. So most persons already have accounts. So if you have an account, then you can do online banking. We can't do online banking unless you have the account first. So I just want to clear that up. In the US and some spaces, you can actually open a bank account online using the internet where you do biometrics, they look at your face and they, they you put your passport in the camera and you say, oh yeah, that passport is actually shell stubs and they can verify you remotely and you can open an account online in some places in the US. In the Bahamas, we've not done that yet. To make that initial, um, open that initial account, you have to actually go into the bank because we require that verification process. We want to see you and see your documents and get contacts from you. So. Currently, we're not able to do that online, but once you have the bank account set up, and most of you already do, then you get to sign up for online banking. So that you, once that account is active, you can do everything else you need from your home. So what do you need to do it? Ms. Bodhi told you, you need some stuff to be able to navigate this space, a uh, personal computer, a smartphone, a tablet. You need some instrument to be able to access the internet banking. So you just don't get to, um, speak it, you have to actually touch a computer, touch a smartphone, touch a tablet. And of course, if you, most of your phones already, you know how those work, you have passwords that get you in and you can do various apps to be able to manage whatever you want um, via that, that instrument. So you need the instrument to start with. And then you also need something called the internet connection. You're here today, you understand what that means. You need Wi-Fi or you need a data package. You go to Kill Bahamas BTC and get that. So be, to be able to facilitate your own line banking or your internet banking, you got to have an instrument and then you have to have a connection. So those are two critical things and I don't want to um, be too simplistic, but I just want to help people understand that um, those, these are key components to be able to help you to navigate the internet banking space. So in case that's something that you're doing already, we're going to explain a little bit about how it works. So most banks, and we've been trying to get you to do this for a while. I don't know if you guys remember the days when you had bank books and you'd go into the bank and you had a huge book that looks like this and you, you know, you kept that book because that was almost a Bible. You would not, you know, go anywhere without your bank book. Your bank book was a secret that you kept. Some older people kept that bank book in their bosom because that was their private information. And then banks started to say, oh, you don't need your bank book anymore. We're going to give you something called a debit card, or you're going to get an e-statement, or you come into bank to get a printout statement. And we kind of got thrown off course. But why is the bank not giving away information? What is the bank trying to do? Um, the bank really was moving in the direction of doing things electronically, e-banking. And then we saw these monstrous creation called ATM machines. And they gave you a card. They said, oh, you don't have to come to the tell anymore. You just take this card and you go right there and it'll give you cash. And we thought, oh, that's super crazy. How do they know me? How do I, am I going to, how are they going to access my account and just give me money? But all that's part of what happens in the background on technology, like Mr. Bodhi explained. And so the ATM machine was moving us again towards internet banking. So nowadays, we're kind of moving a little bit further. So really, this is not new. We're just kind of in a progression state. We're actually going to be able to do and what we're doing now is doing other transactions online where we don't even have to go into the branch at all. So we're not beginning. We're actually in the middle and maybe moving further to the end. We not know things are always evolving. That's a wonderful thing, but internet is not static. It's always something new out there. So when we started doing the taking away the bank books and then we had the ATM machines, now we can do everything from our cell phone or from our tablet or from our computer and do any transaction that we want from the comfort of our bedrooms, from our bathrooms, from our kitchens, wherever you want to be, you can do an internet transaction. And so we've made it really, really easy for you to transact. And when um, we said skip the line, you really don't have to go into the bank to do most things nowadays. So what are some of the things that you can do? You can pay your bills. Um, I, you know, I kind of pass through the malls on Saturday. I see tons of people standing on BPL line, cable line, um, water and sewage line, cash and go lines, just waiting to do transactions. And you think, wow, you could actually stay home, have your Saturday to watch a movie and pay all your bills in one click. So you, once you have access to your accounts via the internet and how that happens is you go into the bank. And like I said, they will give you a debit card, set up a password. Um, 
all the banks now have what they call ambassadors where you can they will show you step by step they, they're in the bank they have a tablet they tell you here's how it look you go into the site and when you get on the site you click here they have um they outline to you exactly all the things that you need to do to be able to set the to set up that account online and to be able to access online and they also tell you well if you can come into the bank first to show you here's a hotline a help desk most banks have 12 hours some have 24 hour hotlines and you can call and say listen i'm trying to access my account online can you walk me through it and so there's a lot of help out there um you can have all that you need to help you get online and once that happens you can begin this process of paying your bills and you can pay any utility bill online now you can pay insurance online you can pay security bills there's so many things that you can do online so many companies that are hooked on that once you get access you can transfer money from your account to your account at that institution and your bill is paid instantly you can pay a credit card bill you can pay a loan you can also transfer money a lot of us have kids away grandkids away um, you want to send them a hundred dollars they're stuck in a mall and say grammy i need fifty dollars you can go on your online put that fifty dollars to their account and they can be they can access it almost immediately so it's a wonderful way to be able to help people to do things to transfer money you can set up a template and get that done quickly and the persons that you're trying to help get the benefit of your um help immediately um like miss Cody said you can shop online you know we love to go into malls we love to go into walmart with COVID-19, that's not as safe as it used to be. So now you can stay home. You can go on their website over the internet. You can see all the wonderful products. You can click on your size and you can actually pay online and have that shipped to you. So this wonderful world of internet banking is something that has made our lives so much easier. And it's something that we want to help you embrace. Um, as you get older, you want to make the most of your time. You want to use your time wisely. You don't want to spend it online. So you want to spend it um, sitting in the, the bank for two hours on a Friday when it's government payday or when it's the construction payday and it takes the lines of three hour long or BPL or water and sewage or cable Bahamas. And then of course, if you want to send money to someone you love, you can do that right away. You don't have to go on a on long line and, and make that happen. You can actually sit home and, and get that call in an hour, that person can have that money that you want. So, I have to tell you that there are pros and cons to this internet banking. And let's start with talking about the pros. It is convenient. It is absolutely convenient. When I say literally, you can be anywhere. You could be in your car, you could pull on the side and you can send someone money on your mobile phone once you have a data package. It is super, super convenient. And I can't stress how, how wonderful that is and how much time you save. It is the most convenient way to do banking and we couldn't imagine this 10 years ago. Um, going to the bank was almost um, an event. Um, you had to plan it. You know your lunch hour wasn't enough time and you were working. And now you plan it as an event because you know it's a, a morning ordeal. It is super convenient. You can do all of it in from your home and with wonderful speed. So internet banking is so quick. You have five bills to pay. Five bills would have taken you two days. You can do all of that maybe in half an hour. You can access your account and so you have templates set up. You can pay quickly all of your bills. So if you got a call from Kale Bahamas today and say, listen, uh, your bill's overdue, we can quickly jump on your phone, pay that bill, and they don't have to shut you off. So that's really one of the wonderful things about the speed of the internet. And then you have the efficiency. You know, I used to always laugh at my dad with his bank book. He kept at this chest. He always wanted to know how much money he had. You can be looking at your bank account 24 seven on the internet. You don't have to go into the bank and get a printout. You could, you don't have to say, what if this updated? Once you are on the internet, you can see all of the transactions and you can watch it. And it gives you pleasure to see that you have $50 or you spent um, $2. You can do that online all day all night you can watch your account and so it's super super efficient now there are some downsides and mr Bodhi basically had to explain to you that um these downsides do exist um, i'm going to start at the bottom the learning curve so it takes some time to get set up and i told you earlier that you could actually get help from the bank you can get help from 
um, the help desk, you can call. And you can also get help from the Gen Zen. You have somebody in your house who's born in gener Generation X or Z, and they understand everything about internet. They were born in the internet age. So they can help you quickly to understand anything. So the learning curve doesn't have to be an impediment. It does take some time to get organized. It does take some time to set it up. And like I said, when you're paying your bills, you set up a template. That template is your account at BPL, you find out what your account is, you set up that template. Your account at Kill Bahamas, you set that up. Your account at Water and Sewage, you set that up and you're able to just transfer. You don't have to every day create a new account. Once that template is set up, you easily go online with your password and you can actually access that template and send it. So you know it's your account. You don't always have to remember that account, you have it done. If you've sent money to me once, um, and I got it, and that template is created. You can use that and access that um, whenever you need it. So you don't have to always say, oh, what is, um, what is my grandchild's account number? What's her bank's number? All that, once you do it once, it makes it a lot easier. And so that template is set up. So the learning curve initially can be hard, but once it gets going, you have the benefit of accessing and doing things fairly quickly. Um, the trust element, I know a lot of older persons are not trusting oh boy what or how why why can i i want to touch my money i want to feel the cash why do i have to um do this, this stuff remotely and i don't get to get the money in my hand and pay the bill and i give didn't give the bill to the person in bpl am i sure they're going to get it well we're moving away from being a cash society we're trying to be cashless as possible and if you've if you've noticed recently you can almost do any transaction without cash in the Bahamas. It was, it's been that way for a while in America. So if you've traveled, you've seen that you can swipe for anything and everything. In fact, some places do not want your cash. Nowadays in the Bahamas, we've made it so much easier as well. You can, you can go to fast food lines, Wendy's, McDonald's, and swipe the card. So we want to get away from moving, from, from using cash. And that's the benefit of online banking. You don't have to feel that cash. It still works. It's still your money. And you're still actually paying those bills, but you're not having to touch that cash. So you have to trust that the system works. And it does. We've been doing it in other spaces for a while. And I think for a lot of us, we feel like, oh my God, um, is it trustworthy? Um, um, are they accounting for my money correctly? But because of the internet, you can actually look and see what's happened. You can see money with coming in, money going out very easily. Um, whenever you want. And so the trust element is something that I know we struggle with. A lot of persons don't feel so comfortable with, but as you get to use it and you get to understand and you get to monitor more, you can actually see that it is trustworthy. Um, not that we've not had incidents of fraud, but you get alerts now. Anytime I go into Super Value and I swipe my card, instantly your alert says you've just spend $50 at Super Value. So if that wasn't me, that alert would come to my phone and I'd say, oh my God, somebody's using my card. So the alerts help you with that trust element. It helps you with the security element. And a lot of banks do things differently, but alerts is the most a popular one now. They send you a text message. You just transacted at BPL. If you didn't go to BPL, then you say, oh, that's not me, someone's using my card. And so you can go and check, call the bank and investigate. But the trust element is actually one that we struggle with and i think the banks are really trying hard to make that a lot easier for you and of course fraud um mr Bodie would have said that you don't click on any site um, most banks are not going to ask you to send your name and your password to them by email so you gotta have to be um kind of aware and understand that there are persons out there who are not as honest as we are and they're going to try to um commit fraudulent activities on your account but you need to be aware um, and you need to understand that certain behaviors are not acceptable. Um, he mentioned phishing, where people are just trying to get information from you so they get access to your account. You want to be aware of that. You want to be careful where you click, what sites you go on, and who you allow access to your information. And to be honest with you, um, you know, we feel, you know, a lot of times we, we give persons access to our information. We have our PIN, which is a personal identification number, and sometimes we give it our grandchildren, we give it to our spouses, and we allow them to go and they have access to our accounts and then when the money's missing, we say, oh, how did that happen? So sometimes it's not even really fraud, it's just us not being as secure as so we need to be with our personal identification numbers and our personal information. Your pin is like your signature. So when you give it to someone, they're gonna use it. And so you have to be careful who you allow that space. We usually tell persons in the bank, do not give anybody your PIN. It's call a personal identification number for that very reason. It's personal to you. Do not leave it hanging around. Do not give it to persons. Um, if you're not able to go into the bank, you may wanna consider 
or if you're not you if you're not comfortable with doing everything um online in this instance and you want to have somebody help you then you can have that set up legally you can have what we call you can give joint access to yourself so you can actually have somebody who you trust to be jointly on your account with you and they have signed an authority and that person you trust implicitly so you allow them access to your financial situation your money if you allow them access to your account you can go to bank formally and give them access or you can set up a power of attorney for time and say you know what i'm not well now uh, i might not be able to do everything on my own i'm going to allow my daughter to be a power of attorney she has access to the account it's a legal document you trust her and you trust that she's going to follow your instructions and so you give her a power of attorney and she has access So most government websites have gov.bs. Next slide. And the coat of arms. So here are a few examples. So the main site is bahamas.gov.bs. If you want to get to Ministry of Health, it's bahamas.gov.bs slash health. Ministry of Finance is slash finance. So when you see these slashes, that means there are sub-sites under the main website. Then we have forms.bahamas.gov.bs. There are over 300 forms there uh, that you can access. If you ever want to get to any of the laws of the Bahamas, you don't have to worry about a big book or big books. You can go to laws.bahamas.gov.bs. And our newest site is socialassistance.bahamas.gov.bs, which allows you to get to services for social um, for Department of Social Services. Currently, there's only food assistance, but more to come. Other types of um, government sites, you have opm.gov.bs, revenue.gov.bs. So you see the trend here, .gov.bs. Next, next slide. So how to access online services. What do I need to do? Next slide. Right, so let's start from the left-hand side. Usually you have to log in, and this is what you commonly do um, if you want to access any kind of service, whether or not you're buying airline tickets, and it's the same with government, you have to log in. But what happens if you don't have an account? So you then have to register. So let's look at the right-hand side of the screen. So once you click on register, you will get a screen that asks you very um, typical type of information. It might be too small for you, but usually you have to put in your name. Um, sometimes it's your first name, last name, your middle initial if you have one. Um, you also have to put in your uh, contact number because sometimes we need to get in contact with you. You have to have an email address. So if you don't have an email address, you're going to have to probably ask somebody to help you obtain one from Gmail or Live, one of those. And sometimes they ask you to confirm it just to make sure that you actually typed in your email address correctly. Then you put in the password. And Errol spoke about this. If you have a pen and paper, I quickly want you to write down this passphrase for me. Happy me exclamation mark. So you might say, happy me, exclamation mark, that's way too simple. But what you can do is you can switch some of the letters with numbers. So for example, I might switch H with a four. I might switch A with the at sign, then P, P, Y, then I have an M. Then I might put a three instead of E for me, and then an exclamation mark. So I asked you first to type down happy me and an exclamation mark. And now I'm going to ask you to write four, the number four, the at sign, P, P, Y, M, three, exclamation. And if you really look at that, you say, well, yeah, I could see happy me, exclamation in that. So you have to be a bit creative with your password. So once you've put in your password and confirm the password, and this is another good um, step because you might write, type something in and then didn't realize that if you have fat fingers like me that you, um, you clicked on the wrong key, then you'd have to put in your date of birth, your country of birth, and another important thing is your NIB number. Always have your NIB number. Then you're gonna see this little thing called a, um, capture. 
and it's trying to find out, are you a robot? What, so what happens is that persons have these little programs called robots, and they just ch turn away, turn away, turn away, trying to access the system using automatic um, algorithms and codes. So to avoid having some little automated program trying to access the system, people put in this thing called CAPTCHA. So let's just go over to the left-hand side of the screen, and you see this thing with this traffic light? And I'll tell you, I really don't like these, but that's what it is. So they ask you to please find out all the track, click on all the squares that you can see the traffic light. And then you click submit. And what the computer now knows that, hey, it wasn't just a, a machine automated program trying to get in. It was actually somebody looking at the screen and clicking on all the boxes that have the traffic light. So once you've gotten your code and you've submitted, oh, sorry, one more thing is that at the very bottom of the screen, you see a little box and it's called a declaration. A lot of people says, well, you know, I need to have a signature. Where's my signature? But we have laws in the Bahamas that allows you to have a declaration and a check sign. And once you've typed your name or typed your email address, that's considered your signature because only, your, um, only you should know your password. So when you check that box, you're now legally bound, but be, just as if you had done a signature. So once you have your username and your password, you're ready, set, go to log in. So you go to your login screen, type in your username and your password. Next screen. Right, so what are some of the other things they may ask you for? Security questions. These are questions that you know the answer to. And if you ever forget your password, either if you make a phone call to the, um, to the business or if they prompt you with the questions, then you have to answer. So for example, things like, what's the first name of your first grade teacher? Now, how many of you could remember that? <sighs> name of your first pet? My first pet was Cola, but I don't use that um, question. Um, last name of the pers first person you ever kissed. And I could hear some of you giggling or scratching your head trying to figure out now who was that. So, um, so you have your security questions, then you have upload of supporting documents. Upload, you usually see a little button that says browse. And you, when you click that browse screen, it goes into your system to where you can select files from your computer. So usually you would ask to upload something like the identification pages of your passport or your NIB. And it's okay for you to snap a picture of it and you can use that and send it as a supporting document. Um, sometimes if you're doing business with government, you have to have what is called a tax, tax identification number or a TIN. Um, some services may require that. Uh, even if you are non-VAT registrant, that means you don't have to collect VAT on any of the services that or goods that you sell, you can still have a TIN number. And you would go to inlandrevenue.finance.gov.bs. Um, hopefully, they're going to um, send out these um, slides to you so you don't have to write that down because it's, it's, it's pretty big. Sometimes they'll also ask you for your business license or your company registration number. Next slide. Okay, so there's something called a landing page. Usually when you click to access a service, it doesn't automatically go to the service. It'll come to a page called the landing page. will give you information about the service. It'll also ask you, tell you what you need beforehand. So you'd want to make sure that you have all that information, like your supporting documents, before you start the service. Um, you, the, at the, usually there's somewhere to contact. So if you get lost and you said, well, you know, this isn't working for me, don't panic. You can call the number or you can email and get an answer to, the, um, to your questions. And sometimes you'll see a link that says FAQs. Those are frequently asked questions. Next slide. Popular government sites. So here I'll go a little bit slower. Next slide. 
So you have opm.gov.bs. So those persons that have been following the health on, and the prime minister's addresses, you would always hear them mention opm.gov.bs. And this is the official website of the office of the prime minister. So you can go there to get all your um, COVID um, updates, all of the information with regards to what you can and cannot do during COVID. Now coming up very shortly, or some people do it already, and it's mandatory, you have to go to travel.gov.bs. And if you're traveling domestically, you have to get a Bahamas domestic travel health card. So the middle screen, you'll see a little house. So that means that's the domestic card. And the one with the plane is the international card. So once you click on that, you're gonna be asked a series of questions and you answer them. So if you're traveling domestically, you would have to fill out one of those and you're gonna get back what is called a domestic travel health card. And depending on what the prime minister says, you may have to upload or provide a supporting document. And that supporting document would be a COVID test, uh, um, negative test. And it's usually something called um, RT-PCR test. So it's not any old test you can take. There's a particular test. And then, of course, I gave you the other one, social assistance bahamas.gov.bs oh sorry travel so if you've gone if you've gone abroad to the u.s and you need to come back in to the bahamas you have to fill out your international um, travel card or visa and again you're going to be asked to upload a covid negative test result so i would advise you once you get over in the states and you're only going to be there a couple of days to take your um, test as soon as possible because there are quite a backlog in the states and it may take you up to three days to get a result. Uh, so if you look at the social assistance, bahamas.gov.bs, that's the final um, screenshot that you see at the bottom and you'll see that there's disaster assistance for food. So if there's an emergency, you had a fire, um, there was a hurricane, um, then you can go there and get a disaster, sorry, for disaster assistance, hurricane, things like that are your disaster assistance. If it's an emergency, um, something happened, there was a fire, uh, you just didn't have your, your salary didn't go far enough um, or your pension didn't go far enough this month, then you would come here and you'd, you'd ask for emergency assistance for food. So that's a very handy one for you, socialassistance.bahamas.gov.bs. And for this one, you would definitely need your NIB number. So this is about the Doctors' Hospital website, and our website is very dynamic, and um, meaning it's, it's going to be constantly changing, and, and you would obviously have to you know, get up on the internet, get on the website, and then explore the number of ways that you can connect with us. So we're going to touch on a spectrum of ways. The middle one, you know, telehealth, and just to explain right up front, telehealth is really about the movement of your information, your clinical information, but in a digitized form. We, we have the telephone. And maybe that's what the beginning is all about. You can phone your physician or your provider, and you can basically describe your symptoms. And that basically is a telephone way of moving data about your clinical condition. But if you just go one level up, then you go into the video conferencing. And so the basic understanding of telehealth is your ability to do something just like this, a Zoom a meeting, a, a Google, a Microsoft, whatever forum you use, and you transmit information to your provider and your provider is going to use what you transmit based in a, in a question and answer session to get you to make some decisions on what probably is best for whatever condition you're describing. And there are other levels that we will go to, but I just want you to appreciate that virtual consultations with your usual provider is a platform 
of telehealth. And that's something that I'm sure everyone can do after all of the uh, instructions that I've given here uh, today already. So our, um, our spectrum of services are pretty elaborate. Once you become a patient at Doctors Hospital, you will have an ability to get into what we describe as uh, DHR Connect. And you can see from the spectrum provided there that uh, there's a lot of information that you can reference on yourself, information that would be in your electronic health record. All of the information that we keep on your doctor's hospital is digitized. And that becomes extremely useful, especially if you happen to be traveling, you go to another facility for uh, additional opinion or for extended care. It's absolutely useful to be able to reference the information, the data that's available to you at doctor's hospital. So there is your spectrum of stuff that's available. And uh, like I said, absolutely uh, useful when you, when you move on into other levels of care. So this, this question then um, about getting into uh, telehealth at doctor's hospital and the virtual consultations, the COVID um, pandemic was a precipitant. It, it, it catapulted us into the telehealth space. We had lots of plans for our virtual um, consultations and um, along came the uh, pandemic and all those plans were fast forwarded. In fact, globally, you'd find that virtual consultations, by that I mean getting up again on the Zoom or Google space and chatting with your provider, and especially for seniors, that becomes particularly important because most seniors will want to have conversations with their providers about the management of chronic conditions. You don't normally would run into an acute condition and call your provider. Obviously, if you have, you know, a new onset illness, then fine, you can do that, a cold, a flu, and especially trying to make decisions about some of the respiratory symptoms that you may develop and trying to sift through with the imminent flu season, sift through whether, you know, is this flu or should I be concerned about COVID? Uh, should I stay home? Should I go to a facility? Should I just drive to a, a testing facility, etc.? So those are very important decisions that you can make in a virtual consultation with your provider. And the way to do that again is to simply navigate through the, um, the, the, the screenshot uh, information. Once you get into your particular physician that you need to see, then the appointment will be confirmed with you and you'd be given a link by the uh, unit secretary who is responsible for that specialist uh, clinic or for you to, to, to have that conversation with a primary care doc. So your digital experience does have a brief interruption where you can imagine there needs to be some confirmatory information about you. Uh, you need to be very uh, comfortable that your information is gonna be um, confidential and then once you hook up with your physician, all that information stays in a very confidential space. So that is uh, some of the reassurance. Uh, when we go on to talk about different levels of telehealth, I think you want to appreciate that the next level of telehealth, which is one that we have been working on, is how do we, how do we get into the mobile space? Meaning if we were to come to your home providing care you know, in your home or as the Bahamas being an archipelago, you can imagine that we, we, we have resources that we can move to the family islands and visit patients or go to collect patients. Our, our, our um, ambulance services can go out and um, collect patients. Well, you can imagine how valuable it could be. If the information at the point of providing that service to, to the patient could be relayed to the physician and decisions made. For that to happen, then you're into what we could call an intermediate level. So you're one step up from the basic virtual consultation and you're moving now into a level where we're gonna put certain devices on you and the information is now gonna be relayed back to a physician so that that physician can see what's happening with certain things that we call biometrics. Like, you know, what exactly is your temperature? What is your blood pressure? You know, what is your saturation that, that's become pretty popular when you talk about um, how people respond to COVID. So that's the, that's the next uh, level, a very important level. And if you then move into the advanced level, then you can imagine even more remotely, we may be able to send providers who are able to 
do particular interventions? Well, for them to do the interventions, they would need some kind of supervision. The supervision can be provided by a specialist, or it can be provided by the assist of what we call um, clinical decision support tools. And those tools are, are basically using artificial intelligence to assist the, uh, the provider on one end of the connection and the, um, the person who is actually at the site providing the uh, intervention. You can imagine how useful that would be, especially if you had to perform a procedure, but you wanted it to be done under the supervision of a physician, like you had to suture a wound, let's say, and the physician wanted to make sure that that wound was not complicated. If you made it more complicated, then some of the information could have an override of artificial intelligence. And then the ultimate level, let's imagine that you are so privileged to be at or in the International Space Station and you have a problem. Well, you can imagine if you have a problem, you need surgery, it's very difficult to run or walk or fly back to Earth in time to have an emergency procedure. Now you at the zenith, the top level of what telehealth can do. And that is absolutely artificial intelligence um, assisted. And the interventions then can be done from Earth, robotic uh, interventions uh, done entirely by um, uh, surgeons on Earth, but the, the procedure can occur uh, at locations like the International Space Station. So that's top line, like number four. But you can see that when you, when you move along that path, then you probably need to become very comfortable right now with the virtual consultations with your primary care provider. Uh, a useful thing, that, a useful point that was made earlier was a point about uh, wearables, which track your biometrics. And you probably want to take the data in your wearables. Just go to your physician uh, or show your physician the information that you can and you do record about yourself dynamically. And the physician can work with a way between how you upload that information and how they can then access that very same information about your heart rate, et cetera. And now they, plus yourself, are participating in the provision of your care. You can imagine how great that would be. You can continue to wear your wearable and you can bring all the data that's captured in your wearable into that virtual consultation. I think for seniors, that's just totally remarkable. Information about your blood sugar, if you're diabetic, information about your blood pressure, if you're hypertensive and then other biometric uh, information, your weight, et cetera, you can imagine. That's really very useful to make the conversation very focused. When you get to your uh, physician, there's very little that you need to say about how well your blood pressure is controlled, whether there's been any abnormalities or aberrations in your heart rate or rhythm, they would already have that information. So if there's one message that you take from here today, it would be, you know, let me continue to use my wearable and let me uh, have this conversation with my physician about how I can share the information on my wearable to make the best use, the best value of my virtual consultation. So finally, in a, in a touch point, I want to point out that Doctors Hospital does have this um, very interesting um, kiosk that you see. That this is a digital board. It's a touch screen. We do have navigators at the at the point of entry into Doctors Hospital. And what this touch screen does, the navigators will assist you with that. And I think most most seniors would acknowledge that. You know. That all the information given so far has been very comprehensive and very valuable. But most times there's a trepidation, a little of anticipation and anxiety when it comes to getting into digital devices. And, you know, it's always helpful to have somebody who basically can say, well, press this, press that, et cetera. Even when you look at the banks, those devices apparently are supposed to be very simple, but it's always good. When you look at the airport, similarly, the device is supposed to be very simple, but it's always good to have somebody there who kind of navigates you through. So we do have those navigators. The ability to enroll in NHI, and this is tied to our primary care program. You could find that to be a very useful thing when you uh, do uh, come into doctor's hospital and access, access these uh, digital kiosks. A prescription and payments. Those are the two additional things that you want to bear in mind that are available. You can pay for whatever services. Those of you who have done COVID-19 testing would have already um, familiarized yourself as to how you access our our system to pay and to get a prescription done similarly and our curbside pickup or even home delivery are very useful services so all in all telehealth very useful base remember wearables or whatever data you have data capture move it into your provider have very useful conversations with your provider lots of other opportunities available in the telehealth space lots more to come my first smartphone
Now it's an iPhone. They don't use the word smartphone. It's an iPhone, which is an Apple phone. The other word is the Android, which person don't like to use and touch anymore. This new technology about revolutionary now is about the iPhones and the apps and the features that it has. My own is basically the one that I use most is WhatsApp. This gives me all the information that I need to have. I get phone calls, I get messages, I get all the stuff that I need to keep updated with present stuff on my WhatsApp um, feature. Then my second one is the Facebook. That one is really the senior citizens app. We all look forward to using that every day. Every day we can get a Facebook message, an encouragement message. And so I know the civil service love the Facebook much more than any app that the smart technology offers us today. The other one I love also is my YouTube, where I use my music, where I use my movies, where I use my um, communication skills on that one. We can use that for so many purposes. Now, let's go back to the WhatsApp. Now you see the WhatsApp has this little, I don't have the, like I said, I don't have a presentation, but I know you have that circle, it looks like a little arrow to the bottom of the circle. That's your WhatsApp phone. And when you press the WhatsApp phone, you see person pictures on the side in the circle and you have names. Now for me, as a civil surfer, I found my friend who was not very, very literate in using words. She used the picture and the name of the person and she would press that picture. And once that picture pops up, she says, ah, oh, I got someone to talk to. Then she doesn't write a message. She looks for the microphone on that, on that WhatsApp message. And she presses the microphone and she chats away on the microphone. So we have a lot of video chats going on with the WhatsApp. And that's why I said to me, the silver surface easy way is to use the WhatsApp with the microphone and the picture and the name of the individual. The other one I also love to use is when I use the emojis, you can use a smile. You can use so many different things to say how you feel without saying a word. So to me, again, those are lovely features for the silver surface. Now, I'm not an expert in technology at all. I am only doing this to accommodate my fellow senior citizens who don't know how to use every aspect of the telephone. Now, the Facebook phone is that big word F. F stands for Facebook. And once they touch the Facebook page, all sorts of things pops up. Now you have friends. We didn't know we had so many friends in our life until Facebook came on board. Everybody is a friend. Every day someone is sending you a request to be a friend and you look at you and say, do I know that person? I don't even know that person. But they're asking for a friend request. What do we do? Being the senior citizen we are, we press yes, confirm. You have another friend again. And then conversation starts again. You meet so many people but on this Facebook page. I think it's a blessing for us because we have time now to sit back relax and have an enjoy time meeting people, talking to people. So that one is also a very good one. And of course, emojis on the Facebook is outrageous. Now my YouTube, because we only have like five or three minutes left, I'm gonna go into the YouTube and talk about what we can use it for, for so many purposes. The YouTube, you can use you can download your music, your spiritual music. You could go to church, you could watch a church service. If it's been recorded, you go back to it and you use it again. I mean, you just can do so many things with these apps that they've offered us. I think it's a godsend that we now can use a smartphone. Now the features on the smartphone was, was discussed earlier by Mr. Bodie, Ms. Ms. Stubbs, Dr. Diggers, of course, Carol. There's so much wealth of knowledge I have gained as a civil servant today. And I just want to thank Erica and um, the webinar for being done today to give us a little, a, little, a little glimpse, a little picture of what we can do or we cannot do.